As we develop the themes for each year's Joan B. Kroc Distinguished Lecture Series, we often do so with certain speakers in mind. This year, we're pleased to have Jan Eglund examining the intersection of peace, war, and climate change. But the truth is that Mr. Eglund would be on our list no matter what the theme. Not only does he have a wide-ranging experience in human rights, peace negotiations, and humanitarian assistance, but he also has broad regional experience in South America, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and Eastern Europe. At a meeting today with some students, he mentioned that he has been in 110 countries, and he probably could name them all and speak half the languages as well. <laughs> Jan Eglund is Director General of the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. He was the UN Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and its Emergency Relief Coordinator from August 2003 to December 2006. As State Secretary for the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he initiated the Norwegian Channel between Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization that led to the Oslo Accords in 1993. His international experience began at a very young age when he volunteered to help build a more just society in Colombia at the invitation of a Colombian priest who was touring Norway at the time. He later went back to Colombia many times to try to move that country toward peace, most notably as UN Secretary General's Special Envoy to Colombia from 1992 to 2002. During his negotiations in Colombia, although they were not as successful as he would have liked them to be, Mr. Eglin demonstrated not only incredible persistence, patience, and personal courage, but also a deep understanding of and caring for the people who bear the brunt of violence there. And that, in fact, is where all peace building begins. John Prendergast, the first peace scholar at the Joan B. Crock School of Peace Studies, who many of you may have seen speaking here within the last month and who just left campus a few days ago, described Mr. Eglund as uncompromising in his defense of those impacted by war, human rights violations, and man-made or natural disasters. Please join me in welcoming a diplomat in the most wonderful sense of the word, a man who has seen the worst atrocities and disasters that the world has to offer, but who continues to believe that the solutions to preventing and avoiding conflict and environmental catastrophe are not only in our hands, but in our reach. Mr. Eglund. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me here. This truly wonderful uh, campus, I have, uh, I think, never ever seen such a well located such a beautiful place uh, to have uh, have a center of excellence on peace and learning and uh, i think it's my duty today to bring us a little bit out of the uh, of out of this uh, idyllic place to some of the realities of many other places in the world uh, I, I, I thank you for being here and for applauding. You know, my, my professional circle has been now for many years uh, warlords, dictators, guerrilla leaders, mass murderers. And I, I must say I prefer uh, being with you uh, now uh, tonight <laughs> because uh, they didn't like me, I didn't like them. <laughs> now, I think the, the question we're really asking ourselves Tonight is the following, which uh, I think every generation has been doing, certainly the, the generation of the big wars, some few uh, here tonight uh, would remember them. The Cold War generation that I uh, belong to, grew up then, but also the post-Cold War generation. The question is the following, is it getting better or is it getting worse in this world? during our watch. And during the 1990s, when I got the, that question, again and again, as I visited uh, schools, universities, primary schools, refugee camps, my answer was always then, it is really hard to say. Uh, it seems that for half of us, it's getting better. Certainly for those in the northwestern corner of the world, it was. For a good half of the world population, it was either static, in bad conditions, or getting worse. Not so in this decade. We can, for the first time, 
in a very long time say confidently that for a majority of us in this world it, it is getting better. There is 50% more peace and less war now than when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, which is uh, the, the watershed of, of, of our generation. Uh, there was at that time, researchers uh, found when they made these human security reports, there was 10 uh, genocides in 1989. There is one or two today. There was in the 1960s, 70s and 80s an average of 10 to 20 military coups per year. Now it's between two and four per year. And for the first time ever, the World Bank economists found last year in their, uh, in their surveys that there is less than a billion fellow human beings who struggle to survive on less than one dollar a day. This is an index linked dollar, as you will know, and there is a growing world population, which means that hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty in China, in India, in, in, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, in the Middle East, in Eastern Europe, and elsewhere. There was, I remember vividly because I was an, an, an activist uh, a human rights campaigner and, and, and humanitarian worker at the time, there was more than 20 million refugees in the beginning of the 1990s. Four of those, four to five of those millions were in Europe where we had several wars in the Balkans at the time. Today they reckon there are around 10 million refugees, in addition to the Palestinian refugees and uh, the displaced, which are in separate categories. So there's half as many refugees today as there were only 15 years ago. However, it is a world of contrasts, perhaps more than at any time, as we speak, they will be chopping up uh, big arms that are remnants of the Cold War as a consequence of the disarmament agreement between the NATO West and the old Warsaw countries. But there will be a spread of small arms, remnants of the same Cold War, to, to, to these endless cruel wars of Africa and elsewhere. There is, yes, less refugees, but the number of displaced people remain the same, around 22, 23, 24 million still. There are many more people in school, many more people in higher education, from San Diego to South Africa and to Mongolia. But there are still an enormous amount of people who are even deprived of a minute of education and who remain illiterate for the rest of their lives. So, we have a world of contrasts where the the, the, the good news is that there's only one billion people around one dollar a day, but that's of course also the bad news, and that's why I called my book A Billion Lives. Listen, we've never been richer as an international community, and still one billion people nearly will go hungry to bed today, and they will not have had access to safe drinking water today, they will, will not even have be close to even primary health care. And surviving on one dollar a day is, in relative terms, even more difficult now than before, 
when they know how well we are off. And I think this is one of the new things of our, of our time and age. They know the, the two billion under two dollars a day is even perhaps an even, even better measure. Those two billion know exactly how we are living in San Diego, in Oslo, in Geneva, in Tokyo, in Seoul, places where we are shielded in a, in a degree of peace, prosperity, welfare, uh, like no generations before us. And that makes them angry uh, like no, nowhere before, no time before. And perhaps, if particularly in the following age group, there is 1.3 billion human beings between 12 and 24 years in the world. Of them, the majority will get education and job, but a very sizable minority, hundreds of millions of those 1.3 billion, will get neither of the two. So you deprive, if you deprive tens, if not hundreds of millions of youth of all hope, they are getting angry and they want to move. They want to go north towards this fence or they want to go to the fences of Europe or of, uh, or, 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 or of uh, Korea or Australia or of uh, Japan, which doesn't need a fence because they have a sea. But, uh, but they still have exactly, exactly the same uh, attitude. Now, what would I then say are the biggest clouds on this horizon in addition to the contrast between the rich and the poor? Well, there is one new cloud that we're, we're, we're focusing in particular tonight which is by far the biggest existis existential threat against mankind now in a time when, we're, when we see so much improvement, and that is climate change. There has always been climate variations. I was in Oslo with the, uh, the Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization last week, and he went into detail to explain the difference between climate variation, which has always happened, and climate change, which now is not induced by the globe going in different, in, in, in a new pattern around the, uh, the um, sun, and thereby creating an ice age or, um, a, a, or an ice meltdown. It is human induced for the first time ever. And for the first time ever, it, there is no doubt anymore. There is a consensus in, uh, among scientists that we do have climate change, which is uh, human-induced through emission of, 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 the, of uh, the greenhouse gases. Now, the question then, then becomes, would this lead to War, would it lead to catastrophe, or can we adapt? Well, uh, on that, the jury is out, because we can influence still. I have uh, of late been more and more involved in the discussion of uh, the, the, the possible climate wars. Many uh, declared perhaps a little bit too early when the Nobel Peace Prize was given to Al Gore and the UN Climate Panel that that was in a way evidence that yes, the climate change is leading to climate wars. And some said that Darfur is, is one of the first climate wars. Uh, that is not necessarily true and it's, it, is not, it is probably not true. I just mentioned, I mean, that we've now gone through the last 15 years a unique period of end to wars. 
That is a period when we've seen in the Sahel, in, uh, in, in the oh, hurricane belts of the world and so on, a tripling of natural disasters because of climate change. More, more vulnerable people live more exposed to extreme weather. And where it's dry, it's getting drier. Where it's wet, it's getting wetter. Where it's windy, it's getting more windy. That, that, is, that, is, uh, that is the whole point of, of uh, climate change. W whether that will lead to more conflict or more cooperation remains to be seen. Many have predicted it will lead to more conflict, but we've, but we've actually seen more peace of late. There are indications that the world, the UN, the regional organizations, have had some success in inducing cooperation instead of conflict. Fifteen years ago, we were predicting, many of us, water wars in the Middle East and elsewhere. It was predicted that they would be fighting around and for the water of the river Jordan, around and for the water of the river Euphrates and the river Tigris. None of those wars happened due to uh, the fight for those scarce water resources. Um, cooperation regimes were successful. Same thing in Africa, around the river N uh, Niger and the river Mano. There was a Mano River initiative which was successful. We can influence more cooperation in in meeting the resource scarcity, but we can also see more, more conflict. Because certainly in the Darfur, which was a man-made disaster, a, a, a cruel regime, armed uh, some uh, old militias and said, do whatever you want against the civilian population, which is the support of the two guerrilla movements, and then all hell broke loose, and there was an ethnic cleansing cam campaign. However, the six, seven million people in Darfur today live on less green land than they were 10 years ago. And there is population growth, which means that it is very hard now for those of us who have been involved in the peace efforts and who will be involved in the peace efforts, to help people back out of camps, even with a peace agreement, to a new and good life in this desert, which is so inhospitable because of the climate change. That again means that we need to have a, a, a big international investment, not only on the political level to get more cooperation, but also on the developmental level give people hope, give people a new future in these circumstances. Though it will be uh, the nomads have to be, get her help for a new life. There will have to be more irrigation, there have to be more um, uh, ways of doing agriculture, and there has to be more uh, employment in other areas. I mentioned the growth of natural disasters. I don't think it's, it's, it's really known that there are three times more natural disasters in this decade than there was in the 1960s and 70s because of more extreme weather and because more, more uh, vulnerable pe people live more exposed. There are seven times more livelihoods devastated from natural disasters now than from war in our time and age. Uh, it is impossible, it is estimated, to reach the Millennium Development Goals if this growth of natural disasters continue, and if not, more is done to adapt and mitigate the results. We can also safely predict that in the future there will be 
gradually less refugee flows coming from war and conflict, and it is predicted that, that the current positive trend will continue, and there will be more migration from environmental degradation and from totally inhospitable uh, areas which, which can become waste lands like parts of the Sahel, Yemen, in the southern tip of the uh, Arab Peninsula, there is no groundwater left even now. People can, in the future, perhaps not live there. With, uh, they can only live at such a great cost that they cannot afford to live there, unless they are heavily subsidized by their uh, Saudi Arabian cousins in the north, whom are not very willing, it seems, to help them. Now, sea level rise, which is uh, pretty certain under any of the predictions of the climate panel, will lead to uh, coastal communities having to move uh, inland. There are many reasons that will be, uh, will be migratory trends. I uh, hope and believe we will have a cooperation of the international community to meet these climate uh, changes that will uh, 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 help uh, make poor people survive those great changes. Uh, uh, but the investment will be enormous. In Copenhagen at the, the end of this year, the new Kyoto uh, Convention will st start to be uh, negotiated. It is probably that the, the total global bill of prevention, preventative measures, less emissions, technology transfer from all those who have technology to all those who need technology uh, and, from, for, and for a clean energy, all of those places where they are using coal and other things that should not be used anymore, all of that will cost, cost trillions uh, of, of dollars. Is that more than it is possible for humankind to invest? No. It was probably uh, around one or between one to two percent of, of, of the gross national income of the industrialized countries. It would be a totally different kind of investment that we've seen so far to foreign assistance, but it is possible. It is a question of will. And I, for one, after having seen all of these places and visited all of these countries on all these continents, I remain an optimist. I feel it is amazing what we can do when we work together as humankind. I mentioned progress in peacemaking. When I started in the UN, I saw gradually peace break out in Angola, in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in Ivory Coast, in southern Sudan, in most parts of the Congo, in East Timor, in the Kosovo, and in Nepal, to mention a few. This is very often not recognized, really, what we did and how we managed to do that. For the United States, it was a triumph working with and through the UN, making peace in Liberia. And the United States was the lead country on that, just as Britain was the lead country on, uh, on Sierra Leone peace. Those were places where people specialized in killing each, massacring each other in the most brutal ways. Today, Liberia has a, a, a female president who is, is an example of good governance. There has been a total, total change. And the leader, Charles Taylor, who was specializing in using child soldiers to kill other children, 
He's in jail uh, waiting for his verdict in the International Criminal Court. Let me give the other example of, of relief operations, which was my, my area of responsibility. In the tsunami, 90 countries gave assistance. 35 militaries participated. The uh, uh, carrier Abraham Lincoln helped the UN to jumpstart operations. I think it was day six after the tsunami, all over Aceh. Nobody died because of lack of food, lack of medical services, uh, lack of, of, of basic uh, relief. The same in the earthquake in uh, northern Pakistan. 3.3 and and million uh, people were without a roof. It was four weeks until the Himalayan winter would descend on us. I was there to, to help start the relief operations. It was a race against the clock. We got enough helicopters, we got enough Pakistani and international efforts on the ground, and no one died that winter more than in a normal year, and there were more girls in school than in a normal year when spring came. The UN in this can be very cost effective as well as being effective in meeting uh, the goal. All of these places, I mentioned 10 different places, has been made peaceful with UN and African Union and, and, and local and national efforts with a budget which is, for peacekeeping, $6 billion a year. That is one-sixth of the US military bill in Afghanistan this year, and it is one, ooh, it's one, uh, it's like 5% five per five of the cost in Iraq this year. 5% peace in all of these uh, countries through a multilateral effective action where the US played a very effective and constructive role with and in the United Nations. I'd like to land this uh, uh, lecture before we have our discussion with trying to sum up my 31 year, years of international work since I came through San Diego as a 19-year-old, driving my, uh, with friends from Norway, a second-hand car from Canada to Panama on the way to work as a volunteer in a Catholic relief organization in Colombia. In those 31 years, uh, the, 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 the little bit of wisdom which has accumulated has led me to the following 10 conclusions. Number one, prevention is better than cure. And which is you know, a strange thing perhaps to say for somebody who's lived, uh, you know, had his salary from emergency relief. You know, it is insane how much we spend on the fire brigade trying to cure the wound that could have been healed beforehand. And with climate change, this is more important than at, at any time before. So we're talking about mitigation, adaptation, preparedness, early warning. We're talking about environment work. We're talking about development work. That is how we can get out of this vicious cycle of returning again and again and again to certain countries like Ethiopia, which could feed itself, which could make its own population resilient because there is enough natural resources and not enough talent in the population to do so, but we have never had a coherent national and international effort to make them resilient to the droughts and the natural disasters and the internal strife uh, which has come back again and again and again. An African friend said it once, you know, the approach we've had, you and us, is, you know, 
save me today, kill me tomorrow approach. <laughs> Why don't we have an approach that says, let's invest in long-term uh, protection for these populations. Now, the second lesson then is related to what I just said about the UN, because I think the multilateral institutions must be empowered to become more effective. In a world which is getting increasingly multipolar, with not only the United States as a superpower, but soon also China, India, the European Union, to some extent uh, Russia, uh, Brazil, Nigeria, Indonesia, there will be many powers. And, 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 and China and India are emerging superpowers. Just look at, at Africa, who is doing the most, most of the investment, who is doing most of the international presence now, China and India. In, in this world, the UN must be empowered to become effective. I've been working in the UN. I've seen how it can be effective, but I've also seen how it can be ineffective. Let me mention two things that has to be reformed. One is the structure itself, which must become more representative, where we have to, to, to allow uh, Japan, India, Germany, Brazil, Nigeria, and others, a seat in the Security Council, because it would reflect the world as it is in 2008, and not the way it was at the ruins of the Second World War in 1945, when this structure was made. This, of course, also means that you have to tell these emerging superpowers that they have to take their fair share of the burden sharing. They have to invest more in third world development. They have to invest more in global um, human rights protection. They have to take their share of the burdens in making the world better. They cannot be, uh, p play superpower one day in buying up half of Africa and the next day say, we're only a, a poor developing country, we, we have nothing to do with Darfur or whatever. Now, the second thing which has to happen with the, with the UN is that we have to make the structure more operational. It takes a year to fill a post. It is nearly impossible to, put, to, to reallocate posts. The Secretary General and others have to be able to be more of an executive within the organization so that it can respond more flexibly to world problems as they arise. I have uh, time and again been, been surprised that we did so much good in so many countries, from the tsunami to the earthquakes to the, the, all of this peacemaking, in, not because of, but in spite of the structure there is, which is there. Now, the third lesson is that there has to be not only prevention through development and environment action, there needs also to be early predictable political and security action to protect civilian communities, which in this time and age are as exposed or more exposed to violations as before. It's again one of the paradoxes of our time that, yes, there are fewer, war, war, fewer wars, but they appear to be crueler against the civilian population. I, I sat at the table on when the Darfur was going from a small emergency to a full-blown ethnic cleansing catastrophe. And we saw that there were one or two uh, ceasefires mediated with our humanitarian envoys, not the political one, humanitarian envoys, but no real effort by our member states to enforce these uh, ceasefires. 
and to restrain the armed men and the government that was uh, arming them. Predictable security and political action has to happen. Too often I find that humanitarians become the alibi for lack of political and security action. You send the humanitarians, they provide enough food, water and blanket to keep people alive, but we don't protect them. A woman in, uh, who came to lead a delegation from camps in western Darfur came to me at my last visit there. It was so bad in the camps there that I couldn't go because then there would probably be riots uh, between the various groups. Uh, there was so much anger in the camps and they were so much surrounded by the militias. So the women came to me. I always speak to the women because then you get the truth as it, as it is. Uh, and they told me the following. This, uh, this uh, very art articulate lady, she was uh, 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 illiterate, never gone to school. But she said more as the following. Thank you for the food, came from America. Thanks for the, the um, school in a box, which came from UNICEF. Thanks for the health post. We've never had a health post before, ever. We got all of this in this camp. But do you know that tonight uh, they may come back? They may rape us? They may, they may pillage everything again? Do you realize how it has been to live 1,200 days and 1,200 nights in fear? And I had to admit, no, I don't know that. And it is a shame, really, that you ha have had to live a 1,200 days and nights in utter fear and suffered so much when it should have been an international responsibility to protect you. In 2005, leaders from you know, my prime minister to your president to all of these other leaders solemnly swore in the General Assembly Hall of the UN the following. We are prepared to take collective action in a timely and decisive manner through the Security Council in accordance with the Charter including Chapter 7, which is the one which mandates use of force. Should peaceful means be inadequate and national authorities are manifestly failing to protect their populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity. Um, we now try to remind these leaders what they solemnly swore because they seem to be retreating from this commitment because still there is no protection in Darfur, still there is no protection in many parts for the, for the women of, of Eastern Congo and, and, and for, for the, the uh, the people who are in the camps in, in, in Chad and elsewhere, or in Colombia, not so far from here. My fourth lesson is that we need then, given our resources, given the situation, given our potential, we must set ourselves ambitious goals. We cannot but set ourselves now ambitious goals. The sky is the limit, really. I, I, we felt that very strongly when we were four Norwegian individuals who in deepest secret uh, facilitated the first talks ever between the Palestinian Liberation Organization and the State of Israel in Norway, which led to the famous Oslo Accord. Uh, <coughs> We felt the same when we did the, the tsunami relief, etc. Uh, in northern Uganda, I came in 2003 to see for myself because I've ha I have asked on the first time uh, day on the job my most experienced relief uh, colleagues, what is the worst neglected place on earth? And they said immediately, it must be northern Uganda. 
nobody's aware of really what's happening at the hands of the Lord's Resistance Army in northern Uganda, and we fail to be able to wake up the world. So I said, okay, let's go. So we went, and I was shocked to my bone by seeing uh, 20, a, a place where 20,000 children had been kidnapped by a terror organization which had made them into child soldiers attacking their own population. Very often they brought them to their own village where, from where they had been kidnapped, terrorized into becoming a soldier, back to burn their own village, and then they told them to the kids, now you have nothing to return to. We are your new family. You have to live and fight with us forever. Terror worked in, in northern Uganda. So what did we do? We, we put it on the international news media. We got much more money for uh, emergency relief, so we lifted standard in the camps. We got it on the Security Council agenda. And when South Sudan started a, 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 a discreet mediation between the government and the Lord's Resistance Army, we gave money, facilitation. I went myself to the jungle to meet Joseph Kony, this elusive leader of the Lord's Resistance Army, and told him that if you continue holding the ceasefire agreement, we will give food to your soldiers, we will organize the assembly points, we will be observers there, so you, you're not attacked by the Ugandan army, but you have to stop looting, pillaging, massacring. And it did stop. And two weeks ago, the permanent ceasefire was declared after, a ne after nearly two years of effective ceasefire, and hundreds of thousands of people are returning as we speak, and the children are coming back. Now, the fifth lesson is we need to be more generous then. To be able to do all of these good, ambitious goals that we have set ourselves. Many years ago, it was agreed at several international conferences that the goal should be 0.7% of gross national income in the rich industrialized countries should go to foreign assistance. I mean, it's not a tie-end we're talking about. We're talking about 0.7%. So, how did it go in these 20 years of trying to meet that goal? Well, the average is now, I think, 0.22% or so for the rich industrialized world. I mean, never did I read, neither in the Bible nor in the Quran, keep 99.80% to yourself and give 0.2% to the most needy in, in the world. It is not good enough uh, what, what, what we have now. And it was interesting that the G8 countries in, in 2005 at the Good Initiative of Tony Blair said, we will build up to this goal of 0 0.7, and we will definitely, by 2010, have 50 billion more for Africa. I was very happy. I welcomed that on the world media. Next year, I checked. How did it go? Foreign assistance decreased from the G8 countries, except UK. So, um, uh, you know, my uh, word was stingy. I mean, I, I could have found out uh, perhaps better words, but it, it, it is not very generous when you give 0.2% and it go down, goes down in a world of great, great needs. Now, it's not only the Western countries uh, that, that should step up to the plate. Now, what about the Asian countries, the Arab countries and others who have rapidly growing economies. I've been many times going to you know, Singapore and South, South Korea and, 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 and the Gulf countries and saying, listen, when my country was ha half as rich as you are now, we had 0.7% of, 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 of gross national income in foreign assistance. How come it's not happening here? Uh, I, I think, in a, in a way, there has to be a campaign which says, 
there are 50 rich countries now, not five, 50, that could help to lift up the bottom billion to the levels which should be there. Sixth point, and I need to be quick now, because time is flying. Sixth is, we need to control the arms flows, really. And these are on two levels. Proliferation of small arms. The Kalashnikov is, is really the most lethal weapon in our time and age. It sp has spread all over contemporary ar uh, armed <coughs> conflicts and it's creating havoc. And with unemployed, angry youth, so many places, as I mentioned, and access to, to small arms, it is nearly impossible to create a, a security for ordinary people, and the wars continue and continue. The other big goal is to do something with the weapons of mass destruction which are closer to be used than probably at any point since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Why? Because you can today, on the internet, f find the prescription to make a dirty bomb by nuclear uh, material that you can buy through the black market from Eastern Europe and elsewhere, or in the same way, bacteriological, biological, or chemical weapon. It is not realized that a, a, a terror organization or a rogue government can pretty easily get all of the materials and all of the prescriptions needed. The seventh I've already alluded to. I think we have to be more consistent in speaking the truth Always, as we see it, hear it, smell it, feel it, when we go to the field, to the trenches, to where people suffer. It has indeed, as was alluded to in the, in the, in the kind introduction, brought me in trouble many times. There were five heads of state and government who were after my scalp when I was in the UN and wanted me to, to, to leave my position, I was defended always by the Secretary General Kofi Annan. Why is it so important to speak the truth? Because it's what shields the voiceless. And the voiceless are the people whom we are there to help. It's a strategic choice who should speak out, how, where, and in what format, and very often it is not the NGO worker in the field, or the, even the UN uh, field worker which should do it. It is people like me, people like you here and in, 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 in shielded San Diego, who can and must speak the truth as it is. And, no, and, and, and without censorship, you know, whether you, you, maybe this is our friend and maybe uh, well, how Foster Dollar said, he's a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch, famously, about uh, Somoza. You know, it's, it, it, we, we have to speak the truth as it is. And the eighth, then, is derived from that. We have, then, to focus more on the forgotten, the neglected, and the voiceless. Because I feel too often that, you know, we prove again and again that we're great as humankind when the CNN and all of the limelight is there, typically the tsunami, the Lebanon war, we, 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 we really did what was needed to get the, the senseless war to end that escalated so fast. 1.2 million people fled in a fortnight. It ended. There was a UN force on the ground in no time. There was uh, a, a billion dollars pledged in no time. A lot of things happened. This does not happen like that in French-speaking Africa and elsewhere because it is neglected. And the ninth point, again uh, derived from that one, there are special needs of the civilian population, especially children and women, that has to be more focused on. 
I mentioned that the wars are, um, are fewer but crueler. And perhaps the one thing next to the kidnapped child, children who became child soldiers in northern Uganda, which really uh, was unbearable, was to meet the raped and abused women of Eastern Congo. At the, pan, the hospital called Pansi, there were you know, a group much bigger than this. There were 1,200 women who assembled in a big, uh, a big field. The, 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 they wanted it, the doctor wanted it. They wanted to meet, meet me and hear what I had to say, uh, which was not easy. They were all physically and mentally destroyed by uh, the rapes they had been uh, submitted to. Slowly but surely, they were helped together physically, uh, medically, mentally, to a society which often rejected them, their own society, because they had been so uh, broken and, and uh, abused. It's, it is a cancer in modern war, which has to end. And we have to focus on, on this abuse of women, often children, uh, in armed conflict. It can only be done by a very systematic effort to bring the accountable for all of this abuse to justice. An end to impunity is what it really is a question about. The tenth and final point is that we need, of course, those who are involved in international work, we're all involved in international work, directly or indirectly, we need to ensure there is quality control, transparency, accountability. I, I often uh, try to explain to colleagues and, 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 and young, uh, young people joining that, listen, this is work where the difference between excellence and mediocrity is measured in human lives. And if, if you make soap, it, it is, it's, it's good to have good soap and it's bad to have bad soap. But it's not a question of life and death. It is a question of life and death if we do bad work. And we cannot allow ourselves to not do the best uh, in all of this. And we cannot allow to lose a penny on the way. We cannot allow any corruption. We cannot allow any kind of cowardness as we, as we are on this quest for very big things. Now, are we then first and foremost accountable to the donors? No, we're also accountable to the donors and that has to be audited for every penny. The biggest accountability we have are to the vulnerable themselves. And I remember one, yeah, actually, uh, epic evaluation, which was on, on the drought relief in the 1980s in Africa. And the first sentence was, the dispossessed, the vulnerable and poor should at least have one human right left, and that is to be protected against mediocrity in uh, international relief work. So that's why it's so important with work uh, like you're, you're doing here with uh, peace studies, humanitarian study, human rights studies, because it's a question of, of being better and doing what is so important. I would like to end by, before we, we discuss, by the following question, which is a follow-up to my first one, which is, is the world getting better or, or, or or, or no? And then it's a question, what can we do to make it even much better? And then my answer is, I think for the generation now coming and studying here, I mean, the sky is really the limit. If my generation, I'm now 50 and a half years old, if we sort of half asleep and with half-hearted efforts manage to do these strides ahead, what can one not do now with resources, private and public, which are infinitely bigger, 
than at any time before in human history. Secondly, technology which is infinitely stronger and better than at any point in human history. And thirdly, organizations, non-governmental, multilateral, bilateral, governmental, non-governmental, much better tools than ever before. So, we have everything which is needed to do very great things. It's a question of will. Thank you very much.